The Sorcerer's Crossing Forward by Carlos Castaneda Taisha Abilar is one of a group of three women that were deliberately trained by some sorcerers from Mexico under the guidance of Don Juan Matis. I have written at length about my own training under him, but I have never written anything about this specific group of which Taisha Abilar is a member. It was a tacit agreement among all of those who were under Don Juan's tutelage that nothing should be said about them. For over 20 years, we have upheld this agreement. And even though we have worked and lived in close proximity, never have we talked with one another about our personal experiences. In fact, never had there been an opportunity even to exchange our views about what specifically Don Juan or the sorcerers of his group did to each one of us. Such a condition was not contingent upon Don Juan's presence. After he and his group left the world, we continued to adhere to it, for we had no desire to use our energy to review any previous agreements. All our available time and energy were employed in validating for ourselves what Don Juan had so painstakingly taught us. Don Juan had taught us sorcery as a pragmatic endeavor by means of which any of us can directly perceive energy. He had maintained that in order to perceive energy in such a fashion, we need freedom from our normal capacity to perceive. To free ourselves and directly perceive energy was a task that took all we had. It is a sorcerer's idea that the parameters of our normal perception have been imposed upon us as part of our socialization. Not quite arbitrarily, but laid down mandatorily nonetheless. One aspect of these obligatory parameters is an interpretation system which processes sensory data into meaningful units and renders the social order as a structure of interpretation. Our normal functioning within the social order requires a blind and faithful adherence to all its precepts, none of which calls for the possibility of directly perceiving energy. For example, Don Juan maintained that it is possible to perceive human beings as fields of energy, like huge, oblong, whitish, luminous eggs. In order to accomplish the feat of heightening our perception, we need internal energy. Thus, the problem of making internal energy available to fulfill such a task becomes the key issue for students of sorcery. Circumstances proper to our time and place have made it possible now for Taisha Abilar to write about her training, which was the same as mine, and yet thoroughly different. The writing took her a long time, because first she had to avail herself of the sorcery means to write. Don Juan Matis himself gave me the task of writing about his sorcery knowledge. And he himself set the mood of this task by saying, Don't write like a writer, but like a sorcerer. He meant that I had to do it in a state of enhanced awareness, which sorcerers call dreaming. It took Taisha Abilar many years to perfect her dreaming to the point of making it the sorcery means to write. In Don Juan's world, sorcerers, depending on their basic temperaments, were divided into two complementary factions, dreamers and stalkers. Dreamers are those sorcerers who have the inherent facility 
to enter into states of heightened awareness by controlling their dreams. This facility is developed through training into an art, the art of dreaming. Stalkers, on the other hand, are those sorcerers who have the innate facility to deal with facts and are capable of entering states of heightened awareness by manipulating and controlling their own behavior. Through sorcery training, this natural capability is turned into the art of stalking. Although everybody in Don Juan's party of sorcerers had a complete knowledge of both arts, they were arranged in one faction or the other. And Taisha Abilar was grouped with the stalkers and trained by them. Her book bears the mark of her stupendous training as a stalker. Preface. I have devoted my life to the practice of a rigorous discipline, which, for lack of a more suitable name, we have called sorcery. I am also an anthropologist, having received my PhD in that field of study. I mention my two areas of expertise in this particular order because my involvement with sorcery came first. Usually, one becomes an anthropologist, and then one does fieldwork on an aspect of culture. For example, the study of sorcery practices. With me, it happened the other way around. As a student of sorcery, I went to study anthropology. In the late 60s, while I was living in Tucson, Arizona, I met a Mexican woman by the name of Clara Grau, who invited me to stay in her house in the state of Sonora, Mexico. There, she did her utmost to usher me into her world, for Clara Grau was a sorceress, part of a cohesive group of 16 sorcerers. Some of them were Yaqui Indians, others were Mexicans of various origins and backgrounds, ages and sexes. Most were women. All of them pursued single-heartedly the same goal, breaking the perceptual dispositions and biases that imprison us within the boundaries of the normal everyday world and prevent us from entering other perceivable worlds. For sorcerers, to break such perceptual dispositions enables one to cross a barrier and leap into the unimaginable. They call such a leap the sorcerer's crossing. Sometimes they refer to it as the abstract flight, for it entails soar soaring from the side of the concrete, the physical, to the side of of expanded perception and impersonal abstract forms. These sorcerers were interested in helping me accomplish this abstract flight so that I could join them in their basic endeavors. For me, academic training became an integral part of my preparation for the Sorcerer's Crossing. The leader of the sorcerer's group with whom I am associated, the Nawal, as he is called, is a person with a keen interest in formal academic erudition. Hence, all those under his care had to develop their capacity for the abstract, clear thinking that is acquired only in a modern university. As a woman, I had an even greater obligation to fulfill this requirement. Women in general are conditioned from early childhood to depend on the male members of our society to conceptualize and initiate changes. 
the sorcerers that trained me had very strong opinions in this regard. They felt that it is indispensable that women develop their intellects and enhance their capacity for analysis and abstraction in order to have a better grasp of the world around them. Also, training the intellect is a bona fide sorcerer's subterfuge. By deliberately keeping the mind occupied in analysis and reasoning, sorcerers are free to explore, unimpeded, other areas of perception. In other words, while the rational side is busy with the formality of academic pursuits, the energetic or non-rational side, which sorcerers call the double, is kept occupied with the fulfillment of sorcery tasks. In this way, the suspicious and analyt analyt analytic analytic mind is less likely to interfere or even notice what is going on at a non-rational level. The counterpart of my academic development was the enhancement of my capacity for awareness and perception. Together, the two develop our total being. Working together as a unit, they took me away from the taken-for-granted life that I had been born into and socialized for as a woman to a new era of greater perceptual possibilities than what the normal world had in store for me. That is not to say that solely my commitment to the world of sorcery was enough to assure my success. The pull of the daily world is so strong and sustained that in spite of their most assiduous training, all practitioners find themselves again and again in the midst of the most abject terror, stupidity, and indulging as if they had learned nothing. My teacher warned me that I was no exception and that only a minute to minute relentless struggle can balance one's natural but stupefying insistence to remain unchanged. After a careful examination of my final aims, I in conjunction with my cohorts, arrived at the conclusion that I have to describe my training in order to emphasize to seekers of the unknown the importance of developing the ability to perceive more than we do with normal perception. Such enhanced perception has to be sober, pragmatic, new way of perceiving. It cannot be, under any condition, merely the continuation of perceiving the world of everyday life. The events I narrate here depict the initial stages of sorcery training for a stalker. This phase involves the cleansing of one's habitual ways of thinking, behaving and feeling by means of a traditional sorcery undertaking, one which all neophytes need to perform, called the recapitulation. To complement the recapitulation, I was taught a series of practices called sorcery passes, involving movement and breathing. And to give these practices an adequate coherence, I was instructed with the accompanying philosophical rationales and explanations. The goal of everything I was taught was the redistribution of my normal energy and the enhancement of it so that it could be used for the out of the ordinary feats of perception demanded by sorcery training. The idea behind the training is that as soon as the compulsive pattern of old habits, 
thoughts, expectations, and feelings is broken by means of the recapitulation, one is indisputably in the position to accumulate enough energy to live by the new rationales provided by the sorcery tradition and to substantiate those rationales by directly perceiving a different reality. The Sorcerer's Crossing. Chapter 1. I had walked to an isolated spot, away from the highway and people, in order to sketch the early morning shadows on the unique lava mountains that fringe the Gran Desierto in southern Arizona. The dark brown jagged rocks sparkled as bursts of sunlight illuminated their peaks. Strewn on the ground around me were huge chunks of porous rock, remnants of the lava flow from a gigantic volcanic eruption. Making myself comfortable on a large clump of rock and oblivious to anything else, I had sunk into my work, as I often did in that rugged, beautiful place. I had finished outlining the promontories and depressions of the distant mountains when I noticed a woman watching me. It annoyed me no end that someone would disturb my solitude. I tried my utmost to ignore her, but when she moved nearer to look at my work, I turned around in anger to face her. Her high cheekbones and shoulder-length black hair made her look Eurasian. She had a smooth, creamy complexion, so it was difficult to judge her age. She could have been anywhere between 30 and 50. She was perhaps two inches taller than I, which would have made her 5'9", but with her powerful frame, she looked twice my size. Yet, in her black silk pants and oriental jacket, she seemed extremely fit. I noticed her eyes. They were green and sparkling. It was that friendly gleam that made my anger vanish. And I heard myself asking the woman an inane question. Do you live around here? No, she said, taking a few steps toward me. I'm on my way to the U.S. border checkpoint at Sonoita. I stopped to stretch my legs and ended up in this desolate spot. I was so surprised to see someone out here, so far away from everything, that I couldn't help intruding the way I have. Let me introduce myself. My name is Clara Grau. She extended her hand, and I shook it. And without the slightest hesitation, I told her that I was given the name Taisha when I was born. But later, my parents didn't think the name was American enough and began calling me Martha after my mother. I detested that name and decided on Mary instead. How interesting, she mused. You have three names that are so different. I'll call you Taisha, since it's your birth name. I was glad she had selected that name. It was the one I had chosen myself. Although at first I had agreed with my parents about the name being too foreign, I had disliked the name Martha so much that I ended up making Taisha my secret name. In a harsh tone that she immediately concealed behind a benign smile, she bombarded me with a series of statements in the guise of questions. You're not from Arizona, she began. I responded to her truthfully, 
an unusual thing for me to do. Accustomed as I was to being cautious with people, especially strangers. I came to Arizona a year ago to work. You could be more than 20. I'll be 21 in a couple of months. You have a slight accent. You don't seem to be an American, but I can't pinpoint your exact nationality. I am an American, but as a child, I lived in Germany, I said. My father is American, and my mother is Hungarian. I left home when I went to college and never went back because I didn't want to have anything more to do with my family. I take it you didn't get along with them. No, I was miserable. I couldn't wait to leave home. She smiled and nodded, as if she was familiar with the feeling of wanting to escape. Are you married? The woman asked. No, I don't have anyone in the world. I said that with a touch of self-pity. I had always had whenever I talked about myself. She didn't make any comment, but spoke calmly and precisely, as if she wanted to put me at ease, and at the same time convey as much information about herself as she could with each of her sentences. As she talked, I put my drawing pencils in my case, but without taking my eyes away from her. I didn't want to give her the impression I wasn't listening. I was an only child, and both my parents are dead now, she said. My father's family are Mexican from Oaxaca, but my mother's family are Americans of German descent. They are from back east, but now live in Phoenix. I just returned from the wedding of one of my cousins. Do you also live in Phoenix? I asked. I've lived half my life in Arizona and the other half in Mexico, she replied. But for the past years, my home has been in the state of Sonora, Mexico. I began to zip up my portfolio. Meeting and talking to this woman had so unsettled me that I knew I wouldn't be able to do any more work that day. I've also traveled to the Orient, she said, regaining my attention. There, I learned acupuncture and the martial and healing arts. I've even lived for a number of years in a Buddhist temple. Really? I glanced at her eyes. They had the look of a person who meditated a great deal. They were fiery and yet tranquil. I'm very interested in the Orient, I said, especially in Japan. I also have studied Buddhism and the martial arts. Really, she said, echoing me. I wish I could tell you my Buddhist name, but secret names shouldn't be revealed, except under the proper circumstances. I told you my secret name, I said, tightening the straps of my portfolio. Yes, Taisha, you did, and that's very significant to me, she replied with undue seriousness. But still, right now, it's time only for introductions. Did you drive here? I asked, scanning the area for her car. I was just going to ask you the same question, she said. I left my car about a quarter of a mile back on a dirt road south of here. Where is yours? Is your car a white Chevrolet? She asked cheerfully. Yes. Well, mine is parked next to it. She giggled, as if she had said something funny. I was surprised to find her laughter so irritating. I've got to go now, I said. It's been very pleasant meeting you. Goodbye. I started to walk to my car, thinking that the woman would remain behind 
admiring the scenery. Let's not say goodbye yet, she protested. I'm coming with you. We walked together. Next to my 110 pounds, the woman was like a huge boulder. Her midsection was round and powerful. She projected the feeling that she could easily have been obese, but she wasn't. May I ask you a personal question, Mrs. Grau? I said, just to break the awkward silence. She stopped walking and faced me. I'm not anybody's missus, she snapped. I am Clara Grau. You can call me Clara. And yes, go right ahead and ask me anything you wish. I take it you're not partial to love and marriage, I commented, reacting to her tone. For a second, she gave me a fearsome look, but she softened it instantly. I'm definitely not partial to slavery, she said. But not only for women. Now, what is it that you were going to ask me? Her reaction was so unexpected that I lost track of what I was going to ask and embarrassed myself by staring at her. What made you walk all the way to this place in particular? I asked hurriedly. I came here because this is a place of energy. She pointed at the lava formations in the distance. Those mountains were once spewed forth from the heart of the earth like blood. Whenever I'm in Arizona, I always make a, deer, a detour to come here. This place oozes a peculiar earthly energy. Now let me ask you the same question. What made you pick this spot? I often come here. It's my favorite place to sketch. I didn't mean it as a joke, but she burst out laughing. This detail settles it, she exclaimed, then continued in a quieter tone. I'm going to ask you to do something you may consider outlandish or even foolish, but hear me out. I'd like you to come to my house and spend a few days as my guest. I raised my hand to thank her and said, and says, and said no, but she urged me to reconsider. She assured me that our common interest in the Orient and the martial arts warranted a serious exchange of ideas. Where exactly do you live? I asked. Near the city of Navajo. Navajoa? But that's more than 400 miles from here. Yes, it's quite a distance. But it's so beautiful and peaceful there that I'm certain you would like it. She kept silent for a moment, as if waiting for my reply. Besides, I have the feeling that there is nothing definite you're involved in at the moment, she continued. And you've been at a loss to find something to do. Well, this could be just the thing you've been waiting for. She was right about my being completely at a loss as to what to do with my life. I had just taken some time off from a secretarial job in order to catch up with my artwork but I certainly didn't have the slightest desire to be anyone's house guest. I looked around searching the terrain for something that would give me an inkling of what to do next. I had never been able to explain where I had gotten the idea that one could get help or clues from the surroundings. But I usually did get help that way. I had a technique which seemed to have come to me out of nowhere, by means of which I found options previously unknown to me. I usually let my thoughts wander away as I fixed my eyes on the southern horizon, although I had no idea why I always picked the south. 
After a few minutes of silence, insights usually came to me to help me decide what to do or how to proceed in a particular situation. I fixed my gaze on the southern horizon while we walked. And suddenly I saw the mood of my life stretched out before me like the barren desert. I can truthfully say that although I knew that the whole area of southern Arizona, a bit of California, and half of the state of Sonora, Mexico, is the Sonoran Desert, I had never before noticed how lonely and desolate this wasteland was. It took a moment for the impact of my realization that my life was as empty and barren as that de desert to register. I had broken off with my family. I had no family of my own. I didn't even have any prospects for the future. I had no job. I had lived off a small inheritance left to me by the aunt I was named after. But this income had to run out. I was utterly alone in the world. The vastness that stretched all around, harsh and indifferent, summoned up in me an overwhelming sense of self-pity. I felt in need of a friend, someone to break the solitude of my life. I knew it would be foolish to accept Clara's invitation and jump into an unknown situation over which I had no control. But there was something about the directness of her manner and about her physical vitality that aroused in me both curiosity and a feeling of respect. I found myself admiring and even envying her beauty and strength. I thought that she was the most striking and powerful woman, independent, self-reliant, indifferent, yet not hard or humorless. She possessed the exact qualities I had always wanted for myself. But above all, her presence seemed to dispel my barrenness. She made the space around her energetic, vibrant, full of endless possibilities. Yet still, it was my unbending policy never to accept invitations to people's houses, and certainly not from someone whom I had just met in the wilderness. I had a small apartment in Tucson, and to accept invitations meant to me that I had to reciprocate, a thing that I wasn't prepared to do. For a moment, I stood there motionless, not knowing which way to turn. Please say that you'll come, Clara urged. It would mean a great deal to me. All right, I suppose I could visit with you, I said lamely, wanting to say the exact opposite. She looked at me elated, and I immediately disguised my panic with a convivia <laughs> conviviality I was far from feeling. It'll be good for me to change scenery, I said. It'll be an adventure. She nodded approvingly. You won't regret it, she said, with an air of confidence that helped to dispel my doubts. We can practice martial arts together. She delivered a few brisk movements with her hand that were at once graceful and powerful. It seemed incongruous to me that this robust woman could be so agile. What specific style of martial arts did you study in the Orient? I asked, noticing that she easily adopted the stance 
of a long pole fighter. In the Orient, I studied all the styles, and yet none of them in particular. She replied with just a hint of a smile. When we are at my house, I'll be happy to demonstrate them. Demonstrate them. We walked the rest of the way in silence. When we reached the place where all the cars were parked, I locked my gear in the trunk and waited for Clara to say something. Well, let's get started, she said. I'll lead the way. Do you drive fast or slow, Taisha? At a crawl. Me too. Living in China cured me from hurrying. May I ask you a question about China, Clara? Of course. I've already said that you may ask anything you want without asking permission first. You must have been in China before the Second World War. Isn't that so? Oh, yes. I was there a lifetime ago. I gather that you've never been to mainland China yourself. No, I've only been to Taiwan and Japan. Of course, things were different before the war, Clara mused. The line to the past was still intact then. Now, everything is severed. I didn't know why I was afraid to ask her what she meant by her remark. So I asked instead, how long would the drive to her house be? Clara was disturbingly vague. She only warned me to be prepared for an arduous trip. She softened her tone and added that she found my courage extremely rewarding. To go so nonchalantly with a stranger, she said, is either utterly foolish or tremendously daring. Usually I'm very cautious with a stranger, I explained. But this time, I'm not myself at all. This was the truth. And the more I thought about my inexplicable behavior, the greater became my discomfort. Please tell me a little more about yourself, she asked pleasantly. As if to put me at ease, she came and stood by the door of my car. Again, I found myself conveying true information about myself. My mother is Hungarian, but from an old Austrian family, I said. She met my father in England during the Second World War, when the two of them worked in a field hospital. After the war, they moved to the United States, and then they went to South Africa. Why did they go to South Africa? My mother wanted to be with her relatives that lived there. Do you have brothers? Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have two brothers, a year apart, in age. The oldest is 26 now. Her eyes were focused on me with an unprecedented ease. I unburdened painful feelings I had kept bottled up all my life. I told her that I grew up lonely. My brothers never paid attention to me because I was a girl. When I was little, they used to tie a rope around me and hook me to a post like a dog while they ran around the yard and played soccer. All I could do was tug at my rope and watch them having a good time. Later, when I was older, I'd run after them. But by the time they both had bicycles, and I could never keep up with them. When I used to complain to my mother, her usual reply was that boys will be boys, and that I should pay, play with dolls and help around the house. Your mother raised you, in the traditional European way, she said. I know it, but, th but that's no consolation. Once I had started, it seemed that there was no way for me to stop telling this woman more about my life. I said that whereas my brothers went on trips and later away to school, 
I had to stay at home. I wanted to have adventures like the boys. But according to my mother, girls had to learn to make beds and to iron clothes. It's adventure enough to take care of a family, my mother used to say. Women are born to obey. I was on the verge of tears when I told Clara that I had three male masters to serve as far back as I could remember. My father and my two brothers. That sounds like an armful, Clara remarked. It was terrible. I left home to get as far away from them as I could, I said, and to have adventures too. But so far, I haven't had all that much fun and excitement. I suppose I just wasn't brought up to be happy and lighthearted. Describing my life to a total stranger made me extremely anxious. I stopped talking and looked at Clara, waiting for a reaction that would either alleviate my anxiety or would increase it to the point of making me change my mind and not go with her after all. Well, it seems that there's only one thing you know how to do well. So you may as well make the most of it, she said. I thought she was going to say I could draw or paint. But to my utter chagrin, she added, all you know how to do is to feel sorry for yourself. I tightened my fingers on the handle of the car door. That's not true, I protested. Who are you to say that? She burst out laughing and shook her head. You and I are very alike, she said. We've been taught to be passive, subservient, and to adapt to situations. But inside we're seething. We're like a volcano ready to erupt. And what makes us even more frustrated is that we have no dreams or expectations except the one of someday finding the right man who will take us out of our misery. She left me speechless. Well, am I right? Am I right? She kept asking. Be honest. Am I right? I clenched my hands, getting ready to tell her off. Clara smiled warmly, exuding vigor and a sense of well-being that made me feel that I didn't need to lie or hide my feelings from her. Yes, you have me pegged, I agreed. I had to admit that the only thing that gave me meaning to my dreary existence, besides my artwork, was the vague hope that someday I would meet a man who would understand me and appreciate me for the special person I was. Maybe your life will change for the better, she said in a promis promissory tone. She got into her car and signaled me with her hand to follow her. I became aware then that she had never asked me if I had my passport or enough clothes or money, or had other obligations. That didn't frighten or discourage me. I didn't know why. But as I released the handbrake and began moving, I was certain I had made the right decision. Perhaps my life was going to change after all. Chapter 2 After more than three hours of continuous driving, we stopped for lunch in the city of Guaymas. As I waited for our food to arrive, I glanced out the window at the narrow street flanking the bay. A group of shirtless boys were kicking a ball. Elsewhere, workers were laying bricks at a construction site. Others were taking their noon break, leaning against piles of unopened sacks of cement, sipping sodas from bottles. 
I couldn't help but think that in Mexico, everything seemed extra loud and dusty. In this restaurant, they serve the most delicious turtle soup, Clara said, regaining my attention. Just then, a smiling waitress with a silver front tooth placed two bowls of soup on the table. Clara politely exchanged a few words with her in Spanish before the waitress hurried off to serve other customers. I've never had turtle soup before, I said, picking up a spoon and examining it to see if it was clean. You're in for a real treat, Clara said, watching me wipe my spoon with a paper napkin. Reluctantly, I tasted a spoonful. The bits of white meat floating in a creamy tomato base were indeed delicious. I took several more spoonfuls of soup, then asked, Where do they get the turtles? Clara pointed out the window, right from the bay. A handsome middle-aged man, sitting at the table next to ours, turned to me and winked. His gesture, I thought, was more an attempt at being humorous than a sexual innuendo. He leaned toward me as if we had been addressing him. The turtle you're eating now was a big one, he said, in accented English. Clara looked at me and raised an eyebrow, as if she couldn't believe the audacity of the stranger. The turtle was big enough to feed a dozen hungry people, the man went on. They catch the turtles in the sea. It takes several men to haul one in. I suppose they harpoon them like whales, I remarked. The man deftly moved his chair to our table. No, I believe they use large nets, he said. Then they club them to render them unconscious before slitting open their bellies. That way the meat doesn't get too tough. My appetite flew out the window. The last thing I wanted was for an insensitive, assertive stranger to join us at our table. Yet I didn't know how to handle the situation. Since we're on the subject of food, Guaymas is famous for its jumbo shrimp, the man continued with a disarming smile. Let me order some for the two of you. I've already done that, Clara said cuttingly. Just then, our waitress returned, bringing a plate of the largest shrimp I had ever seen. It was enough for a banquet certainly much more than Clara and I could possibly eat, no matter how hungry we were. Our unwanted companion looked at me, waiting to be invited to join our meal. If I had been alone, he would have succeeded in attaching himself to me against my will. But Clara had other plans and reacted in a decisive manner. She jumped up with feline agility, loomed over the man, and looked straight down into his eyes. Buzz off, you creep, she yelled in Spanish. How dare you sit at our table? My niece is no friggin' whore. Her stance was so powerful and her tone of voice so shocking that everything in the room came to a halt. All eyes were focused on our table. The man cowered so pitifully that I felt sorry for him. He just slid out of the chair and half crawled out of the restaurant. I know that you're trained to let men get the best of you just because they're men. Clara said to me after she sat down again. You've always been nice to men and they've milked you for everything you had. Don't you know that men feed off of women's energy? I was too embarrassed to argue with her. I felt every eye in the room was on me. You let them push you around because you feel sorry for them, 
Clara continued. In your heart of hearts, you're desperate to take care of a man, any man. If that idiot had been a woman, you yourself would never have let her sit down at our table. My appetite was spoiled beyond repair. I became moody, pensive. I see I've hit a sore spot, Clara said with a smirk. You made a scene. You were rude, I said reproachfully. Definitely, she replied, laughing. But I also scared him half to death. Her face was so open and she seemed to be so happy that I finally had to laugh, remembering how shocked the man had been. I'm just like my mother, I grumbled. She succeeded in making me a mouse when it comes to men. The moment I voiced that thought, my depression vanished and I felt hungry again. I polished off almost the whole plate of shrimp there's no feeling comparable to starting a new turn with a full stomach, Clara declared. A pang of fear made the shrimp sit heavy in my stomach. Because of all the excitement, it hadn't occurred to me to ask Clara about her house. Maybe it was a shack, like the ones I had seen earlier while driving through the Mexican towns. What kind of food would I be eating? Perhaps this was going to be my last good meal. Would I be able to drink the water? I envisioned myself coming down with the acute intestinal problems. I didn't know how to ask Clara about my accommodations without sounding insulting or ungrateful. Clara looked at me critically. She seemed to sense my turmoil. Mexico is a harsh place, she said. You can't let your guard down for an instant. But you'll get used to it. The northern part of the country is even more rugged than the rest. People flock to the north in search of work or as a stopping place before crossing the U.S. border. They come by train loads. Some stay Others travel inland in boxcars to work in the huge agricultural enterprises owned by private corporations. But there just isn't enough food or work for everyone. So the majority go as braqueros to the United States. I finished every drop of the soup, feeling guilty about leaving anything behind. Tell me more about this area, Clara. All the Indians here are Yaquis, who were relocated in Sonora by the Mexican government. Do you mean they have not always been here? This is their ancestral homeland, Clara said. But in the 20s and 30s, they were uprooted and sent by the tens of thousands to central Mexico. Then, in the late 40s, they were brought back to the Sonoran Desert. Clara poured some mineral water into her glass and then filled mine. It's hard to live in the Sonoran Desert, she said. As you saw while driving, the land here is rugged and, in and inhospitable. Yet the Indians had no choice but to settle around the shambles of what was once the Yaqui River. There, in ancient times, the original Yaquis built their sacred towns and lived in them for hundreds of years until the Spaniards came. Will we drive by those towns? I asked. No, we don't have time. I want to get to Navajoa before dark. Maybe someday we can take a trip to visit these sacred towns. Why are those towns sacred? Because for the Indians, the location of each town along the river 
symbolically corresponds to a spot in their mythical world. Like the lava mountains in Arizona, these sites are places of power. The Indians have a very rich mythology. They believe they can step in and out of a dream world at a moment's notice. You see, their concept of reality is not like ours. According to the Yaki myths, those towns also exist in the other world, Clara went on. And it is from that ethereal realm that they receive their power. They call themselves the people without reason to differentiate to differentiate themselves from us, the people with reason. What sort of power do they get? I asked. Their magic, their sorcery, their knowledge. All of that comes down to them directly from the dream world. And that world is described in their legends and stories. The Yaki Indians have a rich, extensive oral history. I looked around the crowded restaurant. I wondered which of the people sitting at the tables, if any, were Indians, and which were Mexican. Some of the men were tall and wiry, while others were short and stocky. All the people looked foreign to me, and I felt secretly superior and distinctly out of place. Clara finished the shrimp along with the beans and rice. I felt bloated myself, but in spite of my protests, she insisted on ordering caramel custard for dessert. You'd better fill up, she said with a wink. You never know when you'll have your next meal or what it will consist of. Here in Mexico, we always eat the kill of the day. I knew she was teasing me, and yet I sensed truth in her words. Earlier, I had seen a dead donkey hit by a car on the highway. I knew that the rural, er rural areas lack refrigeration, and therefore, people eat whatever meat is available. I couldn't help wondering what my next meal would be. Silently, I decided to limit my stay with Clara to only a couple of days. In a more serious tone, Clara continued her discussion. Things went from bad to worse for the Indians here, she said. When the government built a dam as part of a hydroelectric project, it changed the course of the Yaki River so drastically that the people had to pack up and settle elsewhere. The harshness of this kind of life clashed with my own upbringing, where there was always enough food and comfort. I wondered if coming to Mexico wasn't the expression of a deep desire on my part for a complete change. All my life I had been searching for adventure, yet now that I was in its clutches, a dread of the unknown filled me. I took a bite of the caramel custard and put out of my mind that dread which had sprouted since meeting Clara in the Arizona desert. I was glad to be in her company. At the moment, I was well fed on jumbo shrimp and turtle soup. And even though, as Clara herself had intimated, this might be my last good meal, I decided I would have to trust her and allow the adventure to unfold. Clara insisted on paying the bill. We filled up the cars with gasoline and were on the road again. 
After driving for several more hours, we arrived at Navajoa. We didn't stop, but went through it, leaving the Pan American Highway to turn onto a gravel road heading east. It was mid-afternoon. I wasn't tired at all. In fact, I had enjoyed the remainder of the trip. The further south we drove, the more a sense of happiness and well-being replaced my habitual, neurotic, and depressed state. After more than one hour of a bumpy ride, Clara veered off the road and signaled for me to follow. We coasted on hard ground along a high wall topped by a flowering Bougainvillea. We parked in a clearing of well-packed earth at the end of the wall. This is where I live. She called to me as she eased herself out of the driver's seat. I walked to her car. She looked tired and seemed to, and seemed to have grown bigger. You look as fresh as when we started, she commented. Ah, the marvels of youth. On the other side of the wall, completely hidden by trees and dense shrubs, loomed a huge house with a tile roof, bared, barred windows, and several balconies. In a daze, I followed Clara through a wrought iron gate, past a brick patio, and through a heavy wooden door into the back of the house. The terracotta tile floor of the cool, empty hall enhanced the starkness of the whitewashed walls and the dark natural wood beams of the ceiling. We walked through it into a spacious living room. The white walls were bordered with exquisitely painted tiles. Two immaculate beige, cou beige couches and four armchairs were arranged in a cluster around a heavy wooden coffee table. On top of the table were some open magazines in English and Spanish. I had the impression that someone had just been reading them, sitting in one of the armchairs, but had left in a hurry when we entered through the back door. What do you think of my house? Clara asked, beaming proudly. It's fantastic, I said. Who would have thought there'd be such a house way out here in the wilderness? Then my envious self reared its head and I became utterly ill at ease. It was the kind of house I had always dreamed of owning, yet knew I would never be able to afford. You can't imagine how accurate you are in describing this place as fantastic, she said. All I can tell you about the house is that like those lava mountains we saw this morning, it is imbued with power. A silent, exquisite power runs through it, like an electric current runs through wires. Upon hearing this, an inexplicable thing happened. My envy disappeared. It vanished totally with the last word she said. Now, I'll show you to your bedroom, she announced. And I'll also set up some ground rules you must observe while you're here as my guest. Any part of the house which is to the right and to the back of this living room is yours to use and explore. And that includes the grounds. But you must not enter any of the bedrooms, except, of course, yours. There, you can use anything you want. You can even break things in a fit of anger or love them in outbursts 
of affection. The left side of the house, however, is not accessible to you at any time, in any way, shape, or form, so stay out of it. I was shocked by her bizarre request. Yet I assured her that I understood perfectly and I would acquiesce to her wishes. My real feelings was that her request was rude and arbitrary. In fact, the more she warned me to stay away from certain parts of the house, the more curious I became to see them. Clara seemed to have thought of something else and added, Of course you can use the living room. You can even sleep here on the sofa if you're too tired or lazy to go to your bedroom. Another part you can't use, however, is the grounds in front of the house and also the main door. It's locked for the time being, so always enter the house through the back door. Clara didn't give me time to respond. She ushered me down a long corridor, past several closed doors, which she, she said were bedrooms and therefore forbidden to me, to a large bedroom. The first thing I noticed upon entering was the ornate wooden double bed. It was covered with a beautiful crocheted off-white bedspread next to a window on the wall facing the back of the house stood a hand-carved mahogany etagir filled to capacity with antique objects porcelain vases and figurines cloisonne boxes and tiny bowls on the other wall was a matching armoire which Clara opened. Hanging inside were women's vintage dresses, coats, hats, shoes, parasols, canes. All of them seemed to be exquisite, hand-picked items. Before I could ask Clara where she had gotten those beautiful things, she closed the doors. Feel free to use anything you wish, she said. These are your clothes, and this is your room for as long as you stay in this house. She, she then glanced over her shoulder as if someone else were in the room and added, And who can tell how long that will be? It appeared that she was talking about an extended visit. I felt my palms sweat as I awkwardly told her, that I could, at best, stay for only a few days. Clara assured me that I would be perfectly safe with her there, much safer, in fact, than anywhere else. She added that it would be foolish for me to pass up this opportunity to broaden my knowledge. But I've got to look for a job, I said, by way of an excuse. I don't have any money. Don't worry about money, she said. I'll lend you whatever you need or give it to you. It's no problem. I thanked her for her offer, but informed her that I had been brought up to believe that to accept money from a stranger was highly improper, no matter how well-meaning the offer was. She rebuffed me, saying, I think what's the matter with you, Taisha, is that you got angry when I requested that you don't use the left side of the house or the main door. I know that you felt I was being arbitrary and excessively secretive. Now you don't want to stay more than a polite day or two. Maybe you even think I'm an eccentric old woman with a few bats in the belfry. No, no, Clara, it's not that. I've got to pay my rent. If I don't find a job soon, I won't have any money. And to accept money from anyone is out of the question for me. Do you mean that you didn't get offended by my request to 
to avoid certain parts of the house? Of course not. Didn't you get curious to know why I made the request? Yes, I was curious. Well, the reason is that other people live on that side of the house. Your relatives, Clara? Yes, we are a large family. There are, in fact, two families living here. Are they both large families? They are. Each has eight members, making 16 people all together. And they all live on the left side of the house, Clara. In all my life, I had never heard of such an odd arrangement. No, only eight live there. The other eight are my immediate family, and they live with me on the right side of the house. You are my guest. You must stay on the right side. It's very important that you understand this. It may be unusual, but it's not incomprehensible. I marveled at her power over me. Her words put my emotions at ease, but they didn't calm my mind. I understood then that in order to react intelligently in any situation, I needed a conjunction of both, an alarmed mind and unsettled emotions. Otherwise, I remained passive, waiting for the next external impulse to sway me. Being with Clara had made me understand that in spite of my protests to the contrary, in spite of my struggle to be different, independent, I was incapable of thinking clearly or of making my own decisions. Clara gave me a most peculiar look, as if she were following my unvoiced thoughts. I tried to mask my confusion by hurriedly saying, your house is beautiful, Clara. Is it very old? Of course, she said, but didn't explain whether she meant that it was a beautiful house or that it was very old. With a smile, she added, Now that you've seen the house, that is, half of it, we have a little business to take care of. She removed a flashlight from one of the cabinets and from the armoire, she took out a padded Chinese jacket and a pair of hiking boots. She told me that I had to put them on after we had a snack because we were going for a walk. But we just got here, I protested. Won't it be dark soon? Yes, but I want to take you to a lookout point in the hills from where you can see the entire house and grounds. It's best to first see the house at this time of the day. We all had our first glimpses of it in the twilight. What do you mean when you say we? I asked. The 16 people that live here naturally. All of us do exactly the same things. All of you have the same professions? I asked unable to hide my surprise. Good gracious, no, she said, bringing her hand to her face as she laughed. I mean that whatever any of us has to do, obligatorily do, the rest of us have to do too. Each one of us had to first see the house and grounds in the twilight, so that is the time you must view it too. Why are you including me in this, Clara? Let's just say for now, it's because you are my guest. Am I going to meet your relatives later on? You'll get to know all of them, she assured me. At the moment, there is no one in the house except the two of us and a guard dog. Are they away on a trip? Exactly. All of them have left for an extended journey, and here I am, guarding the house with the dog. When are you expecting them back? 
It'll be a matter of weeks. Yet, maybe even months. Where did they go? We are always on the move. Sometimes I leave for months at a time. And someone else stays behind to look after the property. I was about to ask again where they went. But she answered my question. They all went to India, she said. All 15 of them? I asked incredulously. Isn't that remarkable? It'll cost a fortune. She said that in a tone of voice that was such a character of my inner feelings of envy that I had to laugh in spite of myself. Then the thought struck me that it wouldn't be safe to be alone in such a remote, empty house with only Clara for company. We are alone, but there's nothing to fear in this house, she said, with a curious finality. Except maybe the dog. When we return from our walk, I'll introduce you to him. You've got to be very calm to meet him. He'll see right through you and attack if he senses any hostility or that you're afraid. But I am afraid, I blurted out. I was already starting to shake. I hated dogs ever since I was a child. When one of my father's Doberman pinchers jumped on me and pushed me to the ground. The dog didn't actually bite me. She just growled and showed me her pointed teeth. I screamed for help, for I was too terrified to move. I was so frightened I wet my pants. I still remember how my brothers made fun of me when they saw me, calling me a baby that should be wearing diapers. I don't like dogs one bit myself, Clara said. But the dog we have is not really a dog. He is something else. She had sparked my interest. But that didn't dispel my sense of foreboding. If you want to freshen up first, I'll accompany you to the outhouse, just in case the dog is prowling around, she said. I nodded. I was tired and irritable. The impact of the long drive had finally caught up with me. I wanted to wash the dust of the road from my face and comb the tangles out of my stingy hair, stringy hair. Clara led me through a different corridor, then out to the back. There were two small buildings some distance from the main house. That's my gymnasium, she said, pointing at one of them. It is off limits to you, too, unless I care to invite you in some day. Is that where you practice martial arts? It is, Clara said dryly. The other building is the outhouse. I'll wait for you in the living room, where we can have some sandwiches. But don't bother about fixing your hair, she said, as if noticing my preoccupation. There are no mirrors here. Mirrors are like clocks. They record the passage of time. And what's important is to reverse it. I wanted to ask her what she meant by reversing time. But she prodded me toward the outhouse. Inside, I found several doors. Since Clara hadn't made any stipulations about the left and right sides of this building, and since I didn't know where the toilet was, I explored all of it. On one side of the central hall, there were six small water closets, each with a low wooden toilet, the height for squatting. What made them unusual was that I didn't notice the distinct odor of a septic tank, nor the overpowering stench of lime-filled dirt holes. I could hear water running underneath the wooden toilets, but I couldn't tell how or from where it was let in. 
On the other side of the hall, there were three identical, beautifully tiled rooms. Each contained a freestanding antique tub and a long chest on top of which sat a pitcher filled with water and a matching porcelain basin. There were no mirrors in those rooms or any stainless steel fixture, fixtures on which I could have caught my reflection. In fact, there was no plumbing at all. I poured water into a basin, splashed my face with it, then ran my wet fingers through my tangled hair. Instead of using one of the soft, white Turkish towels for fear I would dirty it, I wiped my hands with some tissues that were in a box on the chest. I took several deep breaths and rubbed my tense neck before going out to face Clara again. I found her in the living room, arranging flowers in a blue and white Chinese vase. The magazines that had been open earlier were neatly stacked, and next to them was a plate of food. She smiled when she saw me. You look as fresh as a daisy, she said. Have a sandwich. Soon it'll be twilight. We have no time to lose. <laughs>